Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you in the house of the Lord today. I am uh, just really thrilled to be able to share with you from his word. And uh, what a great way to spend our morning by spending time in his presence and in growing together in community. So I want to I begin this morning by telling you a story. So <clears throat> my daughter, Nora, just turned two just about four months ago. And one of the gifts that she got was a little fish. And so we asked her, what would you like to name this fish? Yeah, they're, they're scoring about 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10 on the cuteness scale right there. Okay, and so, so we asked her, and she's got like 20 words at this point, and so we asked her, what do you want to name the fish? And so she says, me. <laughs> so this is, that's me the fish. You can kind of see him a little bit there that my son's holding. And uh, so me the fish one day is, is sitting on our kitchen table, and my kids are eating their breakfast, and I'm at this point, I'm uh, just solo with the kids. My wife's already off to her, her job as a teacher, and so I'm trying to be super dad, super husband for a morning, and so I'm downstairs doing some laundry, because I'm a good, good father. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Okay? <laughs> Wait, that's, that's God. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to do this, and, and what I notice is that um, there's something like coming out out of the middle in the actual uh, laundry machine. And it turns out I've been putting fabric softener in the wrong location for the last 25 loads. So I like pull this piece out and it like explodes everywhere, all over me, all over my clothes. I'm like Googling, you know, does, does like tons of softener ruin your clothes? I don't know. Apparently my clothes weren't soft. I thought they were. All right, so I'm, 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 I'm sitting in elbow deep of detergent softener stuff, when my son yells down the stairs, Dad, we have a situation. <laughs> I say, well, son, you're going to have to figure out your situation on your own. <laughs> Maybe I'm not quite such a good, good father. Okay, so, um, so I, I say, I'm, I'm fixing this. He says, no, Dad, you need to come up here. Someone spilled milk in the fish container. Say, well, I know who that someone is, number one. <laughs> and number two, uh, how do you spill milk into a container that's uh, eight inches off the ground? Well, he owns up to it, and I say, well, buddy, I hate to break it to you, but this might be the end of me, the fish. And so and my, my poor son is, like, scared out of his mind at this point. So I try to scoop the fish out of there. Scooping fish out of a bowl is a thing. So this, this is taking me some time. I, I finally get this, this little creature out of here, put him into a bowl, and I start trying to clean it, and I see that the fish is jumping. Well, it's a beta fish, so he's trying to, like, jump out of the bowl. I'm like, this thing's going to jump out, and I'm not going to save his life because he's going to die this way. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I finally, I get a bowl on top of the bowl. I clean out the fish tank, and lo and behold, the Lord is good. Me, the fish, lives. Oh, no matter, no matter what cloudy storms come that fish's way, he's going to make it. Okay, no, so we now call it me the resilient fish because nothing's going to hold him down. And, and, and I joke and, and jest with this, this funny story, but to be quite honest, there's, there's some of us in this room who are facing some, some real actual trials, some real actual storms that are actually weighing us down that it, that it makes it hard to get out of bed each morning. I, I know some of these things that some of you guys are walking through, and I know there's much that I, that I don't. But, you know, for, for some of us, we're, we're worried because we don't have a job right now, and we're worried about what, how rent is going to come in next month. Or for, for some of us, we, we have jobs, but they feel just meaningless and purposeless, and it's, it's draining our soul each and every day to go in. Or for some of us, it's, it's even worse. Like, we, we've lost a loved one, and it feels like there's this hole inside of our heart that's bigger than the Grand Canyon. And we just hurt, and we just ache. And so my question for us this morning is, what, what makes us resilient? What makes all of us as humans, what makes us able to make it through? And, and why does it seem like some people are able to, no matter what comes their way, 
they're able to just push through. They're able to make it through. And, and some people we look at and we think, man, that's, that's like a minor, seems like a minor setback, and that seems to be crushing you. And then somebody else, we're like, man, no matter what happens for you, you seem to just keep getting back up. Is it that some of us have just gone through more? Is it that some of us are just tougher? Some of us are just stronger? What is it that makes us resilient or not? Well, the Bible's got some really interesting things to say all throughout it about what makes us resilient, and I want to take a look at that today. But before we go into God's Word, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I'm thankful for who you are, that you have not forgotten us, that you are with us. God, I pray today as as we dive into your Word that you would make it alive and fresh, and that you would transform our hearts to fall deeper in love with you. Amen. Amen. You can say amen too. Can you say amen? All right. I like a little feedback, so don't don't be afraid to say something, uh, whatever whatever you want, okay? So I'm going to encourage you right now, if you have a Bible, if you can open it up to Genesis chapter 37. Uh, We're actually going to be going through the story of Joseph, and we we actually started it last week. We're going to keep building off of that uh, here today. And uh, for, for, this is in Genesis chapter 37, and, and where we pick up with this story is a, is a familiar story for probably many of us here in this room today. It's Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat. So, so Joseph is, is 17 years old, and he's working for his dad. He's working with his brothers, <clears throat> and he's working really hard. And so he feels like he's hustling, he's grinding, and so uh, he notices, though, that his brothers are slacking. So rather than letting that be, Joseph goes and he tells on his brothers. How many people love a tattletale? <laughs> Zero. Okay. Um, all right. So, so Joseph does that. Now Joseph says this to his brothers. He says, he's, and I mind you, he's the youngest brother. And he says to his brothers, one day you are going to bow down before me. I had a dream that said one day you're going to bow at my feet. Thus saith the Lord, <laughs> pretty much. And, and then you have to get this with the story, too. It says this in Genesis 37, verse 3. Jacob, Joseph's dad, loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him at his old age. Now, here's your free parenting tip of the, of the day. Don't favor one child over another. It breeds resentment, okay? So don't do that. You can write that one down, <laughs> all right? But so, so his brothers now are ticked. He's favored. He, he's, he's somebody who, they're like, they actually get so angry that they say, we want to kill our brother. I feel like that's an overreaction. But, but they are so, they are so, so angry at him. And then they actually are, make a plans to kill him. But then they worry about getting caught. And so they want to cover their own tracks. And so they say, you know what? Let's just sell him to some people who are coming by in a nearby town. Let's sell him as a slave. And then that way way we don't have to get in trouble. We'll fake his death to our dad. And so they do that. And so the father, Jacob, with his favorite son, just weeps for days. He's so sad. But think about this from Joseph's perspective. He's sold away by his family for like 20 pieces of silver. I did some research. That's like, that's like 400 bucks in our, in our terms. And he, he, they didn't do this for any of the money. They, they did this entirely because they, they hated their brother. They would do anything to get rid of him. They wanted to kill him, but they were just worried about their own, their own selves. Now, maybe you're here today, and you feel like some of the people who loved, who were supposed to love you the most who are supposed to be your family and stick with you through the thick and the thin, the people who had your back through anything, didn't. And it's haunted you. And it hurts you. Well, I've got good news for you today. Those people don't get to define your future. You can choose to put your hope and your trust in God. God can define your future if you will allow him. Yes? Yes. And here's, here's, the, here's the great thing about who God is. You see, see, we come into a place like this, even like what Stephen was saying. We come in, we're, we're, we feel so broken. We feel so messed up. And, and we feel like, man, I, if only people knew the real me. 
And here's what God does. He takes our brokenness and he starts to build a masterpiece. He's like the ultimate redeemer. He's the ultimate recycler. He, and here's what he does. He doesn't just put back together. He, he exchanges the old for new. He doesn't just put back together what was. He actually makes an even more beautiful masterpiece if we will allow him to do so. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So Joseph is sold into slavery. So at this point in his life, he's gone through more adversity than I've faced. And he's only 17. I know I, I kind of look like I'm 17, but I'm older than that. Okay? So he's, he's been through more already. And, you know, so, so Joseph, though, he keeps working hard. He keeps, even, even as a slave, he works really hard. And here's what it says, actually, in Genesis 39. He's working, he's working hard, crushing everything he's touching. It says this, Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. So Potiphar was the guy who, who owned him. He's like a political guy, political bigwig dude. And, and he, because he notices Joseph, Joseph raises him up. It makes him his personal assistant. <clears throat> so now he's in this position, and Potiphar's wife notices Joseph. He's... he's uh, he's a looker, if you will. He's a hunk. Um, in fact, uh, would one of you hunks just stand up so we can have a visual? No, okay, no, no, no. Okay, and it, here's how you know that I'm not 17. No 17-year-old has ever used the word hunk. So, okay, <laughs> okay. So, so Potiphar's wife, though, is checking out Joseph, and she actually says, I, I want to be with you. Uh, I, and she invites him to uh, sleep with her. And Joseph handles this well. He says no. And he actually flees the whole situation. He runs out. But in the meantime, he, he leaves something behind. And Potiphar's wife actually ends up framing him and saying, he tried to take advantage of me. He tried to do this and that. And so now, think about this from Joseph's side. He's now been betrayed by his family. And he's been falsely accused of something he didn't do, and he ends up going to jail. He ends up stuck there for something he didn't do. So now he's in a situation where he's facing injustice in his life. He didn't get a fair trial. He didn't get asked questions. Did you do this? Didn't you? No. He's in jail for something he never did. Maybe for you, you feel like you've faced something where somebody's done wrong to you. Maybe it's even an injustice. Maybe maybe. Maybe somebody has mistreated you just for the color of your skin. Or maybe, maybe somebody passed over you for an opportunity just because of your gender. Or maybe, maybe people look down on you, or, or they have, and maybe it's overtly or maybe it's subtly because you were young. Or maybe it's the other side where, where people said, some sort of way, you are too old. You can't do this. Well, I've got good news for you today. That is not what God's word says. God's word says that there is neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all equal in his eyes. From the CEO to the bottom, it doesn't matter. We are all one, united under the banner of Jesus and what he did for us. For those of you who are young, the, the Bible says, do not let anybody, not one person, not your parents, not your brothers, not anybody, don't let anybody look down on you because you are young. Instead, set the example for other people. Set the bar even higher for others in speech, in love, in purity. God's word says that you are made in the very image of God. You see, we look in the mirror and we see all sorts of flaws. We see all sorts of mistakes. We see all our baggage. We see what that person did to us. And we say, that's what defines us. God says, you are made in my very image. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not a mistake. If you believe it, would you give the Lord a clap of praise this morning? Would you just clap for him and say, thank you, Lord, for your undying love that you give to me? Because see, the world and its messages are trying to push you down and say, you are not enough. God is trying to raise you up and speak hope and speak life and speak purpose into your destiny. So the, the story progresses, 
and now he's in jail. He's stuck there for a long time. And uh, Pharaoh, now Pharaoh's the, the top dog, El Presidente. He's the head honcho, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh gets this dream. It's this bizarre dream. You got to check it out. In fact, I'm, I'm going to give everybody in here some homework today. It's summertime. You still get some homework, okay? I'm going to encourage you this week to read a chapter a day, Genesis 37 through 45. I know that's eight chapters, but you figure out the math, okay? Um, but there's some really, really good stuff in there that I think could be super helpful for you to understand this even further. But so for, um, so for Joseph, he's in jail. Pharaoh is the, is the top dog. And Pharaoh has this dream, and, and nobody can interpret it for him. He goes through all sorts of people. Nobody can, nobody can do it. And finally, somebody says, oh, I think there's this dude I forgot in jail. I was actually supposed to help him out, and I totally forgot. My B. And, and uh, Joseph's literally just sitting in jail waiting for him to say something. And, and so finally, uh, Joseph gets his chance. Joseph gets his opportunity. He's been faithful all the way through. And he interprets this dream, and he says, there's going to be seven years of just incredible prosperity in our land. The milk, and, the milk and honey, they're going to flow. Like, it's going to be amazing. He says, but then there's going to be seven years of just ridiculous famine. And so Pharaoh says, okay. And this is exactly what comes to be. And so Joseph is elevated from going in jail all the way to a place where he's the number two guy in all of Egypt. Started from the bottom, now we're here, okay? This is, this is what he does. And so this is, this is his, his story. And so, you know, for, for me, I'm thinking, how does a guy go through the highs and lows that he's been through, especially the lows? How is he so resilient? Because I, I know for me, if I went through that, I, I feel like I'd feel defeated. I feel like it'd be hard for me to get out of bed sitting in a jail cell for years when I didn't even do anything wrong. But, it, you know, and for me, like, I have something go wrong. I want to, like, complain on Facebook. It's just like this little thing. I had a rough night's sleep last night. That's what I wanted to put for my status this morning. And, and here's Joseph, who's being just so incredibly resilient, so why was Joseph able to be so resilient? Here's what I believe this morning is our first point, is that it's because Joseph had a vision of who God had made him to be. You see, Joseph doesn't get swept up in his problems or his situations. He keeps his eyes focused on God. He understands this is who the man I have been created to be, and I'm going to be consistent, and I'm going to be faithful no matter what. You see, Oftentimes, I think our problem is that we focus too much on our problem and not on God. And now, now what I'm not trying to say is that if you've got real hardships and things that you're going through that you shouldn't go and talk to a counselor. That's super valuable. We encourage that. But, but sometimes I think we can get so caught up in, in just staring and letting our problems or our past define us that, that we actually start to be in a position where we blame God or we blame our lack of opportunity or, or we have this defeated mindset and Joseph never goes there in his mind or in his heart. Regardless, he's a slave. He stays faithful. His boss's wife falsely accuse him. He stays faithful. You know what? I think it's interesting. This is what the Bible does not say. It does not read like this. And then Joseph, because he was a slave and falsely accused, became super bitter at God and would never talk to him again. It does not say. And then Joseph, because he was justified, detested everyone who had done wrong to him. The Bible doesn't say that. That wasn't his story. In fact, for Joseph, he gets in this situation, it tells about it in Genesis 45, where his brothers do come to him years later, and they're in this period of famine that he knew would come at 17 years old. And now his brothers are begging for food. And he's in the position to say, I told you so. I knew this moment was coming. And he's the number two guy in all of Egypt, remember? He can wipe them away. He can say whatever he wants. He's in the seat of authority and power now. And you know what he doesn't do is squash them. Instead, what he says is you are forgiven. He flings his arms wide open to the very people who caused him the pain. 
That's, <laughs> that's incredible. The only way you can do that is if you have a vision of who God has made you to be. Like if, if you can keep your eyes fixed on him, that's the only way we could ever be in a situation and handle it like that. If you, if you want to become more resilient, listen to what God says about you. If you want to become more resilient, fill your mind with what the scripture says, not with what the world, word sa- world says. If you want to become more resilient, don't let your circumstances define you. Let God define you. Let him control your destiny. You see, I, I think what's, what's interesting for Joseph is, is that I'm going to say, he, he was faithful. But a part that I think we often miss when we, when we hear about the story of Joseph is that it wasn't just Joseph who was faithful to God. God was faithful to Joseph. Check this verse out. It says this multiple times, actually, in Genesis 39. Genesis 39, verse number 2. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. You see, we think that when, when things are going horribly wrong, when, when my life is chaotic and not going as planned, we, we can often fill in blanks that aren't true. We say, God is mad at me, or I did this to myself. I deserve this. I, I dug my own grave. I, I did this to myself. And for Joseph, he understood that the Lord was with him, that the Lord was for him. And it's not just true for Joseph. It's true for you. It's true for me. The Lord is with you. Even though you're walking through that devastating pain, the Lord is with you. Even though people have said some horrible, horrible things about you, some of which may be true, some of which not, the Lord is with you. The Lord is for you. Even though you feel just incredibly insecure, like if people knew this about me and what I had done, that certainly Nobody would love me. You have a God who still does. You have a God who still flings his arms open and says, you can come home anytime. I'm here. Your past doesn't have to define you. The Lord is with you. Allow him to be the author of your life. So what else? What what else makes Joseph be so resilient? Here's my second main point of the day, is that Joseph was tapped into the ultimate source of resilience. You see, Joseph was close with God. Him and God were very tight. And here's how I know this, is because you can't be having correct prophetic dreams about the far off distant future unless you are like this with him. Okay, and so sometimes we read a story like this and we think, well, I've never had like a crazy dream about cows that end up telling me about the future of my land. Like that, it's definitely not true for me. I'm guessing it's probably not true for most of you in here. If you have, I'd love to hear it. That'd be super interesting. But for, for Joseph, he, we think of him, he's this spiritual super giant. And, and listen to this dialogue between Pharaoh and Joseph, and, and uh, I think it might reorient to how we think about this. It says this, this is Genesis 41, uh, verses 15 and 16. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. And here's what Joseph says. It's beyond my power to be able to do this, but God... But God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. It's like, it's like Joseph here is saying, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? You know, see, Joseph wasn't some spiritual superhero. He's just tapped in to God. If you want to be resilient in this life, you have to be in tune to what God is saying. If you want to be in tune with his voice, you have to spend time with him. And here's what I would say about when we spend time with him, here's a word for myself this morning, we need to stop talking so much. Sometimes we need to just listen. We need to be still and hear that soft, tender voice that voice that can guide and direct and determine where we go, determine our destinies. You know, we, we think 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a prayer. I, I talk with God. I have a relationship with God. And in reality, what it looks like for most of our days is we, we say thanks for our food for 10 seconds. And then we get into this situation where everything's going wrong and we're like, God, where are you? And God has been there the whole time. He's been right by your side. He's been longing everything within him to have a relationship with you. He desires you. You are his child. You are his beloved. And we start to point fingers and blame God. He's been there the whole time. We've been the ones ignoring him. But that doesn't have to be our future. If we want to be more resilient, let's get in tune with the Spirit. Let's listen to what he is saying. Amen? Amen. So I heard this uh, amazing sermon online, actually, this week. It was uh, spoken at Dave Hurtwick, is, is one of my friends. He's a pastor. He's spoken here several times in the past. And uh, it was actually his mom who was sharing the sermon at his church last week. And so uh, his mom is sharing. And, and, and one thing you need to know about their family is they have gone through just an incredibly, incredibly challenging uh, last 18 months, two years, uh, where, uh, so, so Dave's mom, her husband passed away, and then three months later, her son passed away. So they, their family's just hit with this just devastating grief, and, and I can't imagine going through that as a mother and, and what she has had to face and go through. But sure enough, she's this short Asian woman coming up and giving the word of the Lord. And she gets up and she's talking about uh, the passage in Psalms, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And she said this, it it was so simple, but it was so profound that it struck me. It said, when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, keep walking. Keep walking. You know what resilience sometimes looks like? It's like just one step forward. It's just putting one foot in front of the other. Even when, you know, because here's the thing. We're, we're not made to, to sit in the valley. It's so I walk through the valley. God didn't make you to just stay there forever. God says you can walk through that. He's got his guiding hand reaching out to you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to pull you out. Will you reach your hand and grab his is the question we all have to ask ourselves here this morning. Because we don't have to live in the pit. We don't have to live in despair. We don't have to let that be our story. Even for those of us that we are just so confused how this could ever happen to us. We don't know how this could be our story. Even when we are so angry at God. Even when we're so struck with despair. It's saying, Lord, even though I don't get it, I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to turn to you for strength because I don't have any right now. Sometimes it's as simple as that. And it's, it's simple to talk about, but it's hard to put into practice in our everyday lives. But I'll tell you this. There was, there was someone else who responded to people who turned their backs on him. There was someone else, actually, who was stripped of their royal coat. There, there was someone else that was, that was sold for just a few coins by his beloved and, and who actually ended up bearing the consequence of the sins of his brothers. And then this person was eventually lifted from the bottom to a seat of honor. And his name is Jesus And Jesus is the one, yes, amen. Jesus is the one who we can put our hope, we can put our trust in him. He is the one that can truly make us resilient. You see, we don't become more resilient just by trying harder or by trying to get stronger. No, we we become more resilient by putting our faith and our trust fully in him. Jesus is the one who is our strength when we feel defeated. Jesus is the one who is our hope when we feel hopeless. Jesus is the one who brings freedom when we feel like we're trapped in chains, like we've got bondage. He's the one who sets us free. He's the one who says, fear, you are not welcome here. I've got faith in a much bigger God. He is the one that is going to take all of our pain and all of our sorrow and wash it away. One day, he is going to take all the wrongs 
and make it right. He's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for you. His arms are always open. They're always there for you. He is the one. Would you stand with us this morning? Jesus is the one who is our strength in the storm. Jesus is the one who is our identity. Jesus is the one who can be our strength. You are a child of God. You are his beloved. If you believe it, would you put your hands together this morning? You are accepted because of Jesus. You are chosen. You are not forgotten. You are a child of God. If you believe it this morning, would you lift your hands? We're not just going to believe it with our hearts. We're going to show it with our posture and our bodies this morning. Let's sing it out. We are his.